Now look carefully at this prophecy, which was completely fulfilled at the crucifixion of Messiah. And yet the Jews did not recognize whom they were piercing. God's word tells us in verse 6 how Christ was made to feel during this awful time. Verse 6. But I am a worm and no man. I am the scorn of men and despised by the people. All who see me laugh at me and mock me. They shoot out the lip. They shake the head, saying, He trusted and rolled himself on the Lord, that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delights in him. If you take the time to look in Matthew twenty-seven forty-three, you'll see that these are the exact words they spoke at Christ's crucifixion. Let's go on. Verse 9. Yet you are he who took me out of the womb. You made me hope and trust when I was on my mother's breast. I was cast upon you from my very birth. From my mother's womb, you are my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help me. Many foes like bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have held, hedged me in. Against me they open their mouths wide like a ravening and roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is softened with anguish and melted down within me. My strength is dried up. Like a fragment of clay pottery with thirst, my tongue cleaves to my jaws, and you have brought me into the dust of death. Now look at this next verse, verse 16. For like a pack of dogs, they have encompassed me. A company of evil doers have encircled me. They pierced my hands and my feet. No one ever pierced David's hands and feet, did they? This is prophesying about the Messiah, Jesus Christ's death. And as Zechariah said, they shall look upon me whom they have pierced. This will literally take place upon Christ's return to earth. Now look at verse 17 and see the perfect description of a man being crucified. Verse 17. I can count all my bones. Isn't this describing a man being stretched out on a cross? Yes. And Yeshua the Anointed One was stretched out on a cross. 17. I can count all my bones. The evildoers gaze at me. Then you remember the next verse is recorded in John 19, 23 through 24. It happened exactly as David prophesied. The Roman soldiers cast lots for Messiah's seamless tunic after they had crucified him. Verse 18. They part my clothing among them and cast lots for my raiment, a long shirt-like garment, a seamless under-tunic. But be not far from me, O Lord, O my help, hasten to hate me. This was what Zechariah said the Jews would mourn for. This will be their grief. Messiah came, and they did not recognize him because they did not know or understand their own scriptures. Though David told them in these verses that the anointed one would be put to death and even described the manner in which he would die, yet they still would not believe or accept him as Messiah. Isaiah has, had also prophesied Messiah's fate. Over and over again, God told his people, the Jews, what would happen. 
but they wouldn't believe his word. They wouldn't listen to the truth. They wouldn't pay attention. As the prophets had said, they were truly blind and truly deaf. I'll read this chapter from the Living Bible. Isaiah 53, 1 through 12. But oh, how few believe it. Who will listen? To whom will God reveal his saving power? In God's eyes he was like a tender green shoot sprouting from a root in dry and sterile ground. But in our eyes there was no attractiveness at all, nothing to make us want him. We despised him and rejected him. A man of sorrows, acquainted with bitterest grief. We turned our backs on him and looked the other way when he went by. He was despised and we didn't care. Yet it was our grief he bore, our sorrows that weighed him down. And we thought his troubles were a punishment from God for his own sins. But he was wounded and bruised for our sins. He was chastised that we might have peace. He was lashed and we were healed. We are the ones who strayed away like sheep. We who left God's paths to follow our own. Yet God laid on him the guilt and sins of every one of us. He was oppressed and he was afflicted. Yet he never said a word. He was brought as a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before his shearers is dumb. So he stood silent before the ones condemning him. From prison and trial they led him away to his death. But who among the people of that day realized <laughs> it was their sins that he was dying for, that he was suffering their punishment. He was buried like a criminal in a rich man's grave. But he had done no wrong and had never spoken an evil word. Yet it was the Lord's good pleasure to bruise him and fill him with grief. But when his soul has been made an offering for sin, then he shall have a multitude of children, many heirs. He shall live again, and God's program shall prosper in his hands. And when he sees all that is accomplished by the anguish of his soul, he shall be satisfied. And because of what he has experienced, my righteous servant shall make many to be counted righteous before God, for he shall bear all their sins. Therefore, I will give him the honors of one who is mighty and great, because he has poured out his soul unto death. He was counted as a sinner, and he bore the sins of many, and he pled with God for sinners. <laughs> All this was fulfilled to the most minute detail through the life of Jewish Yeshua, Messiah. The Jews should have known that Messiah would die. Not only for their sins, but for the sins of the whole world. As it is written in the Living Bible in Isaiah 52, 13 through 50. Verse 13, see, my servant shall prosper. He shall be highly exalted. Yet many shall be amazed when they see him. Yes, even far off foreign nations and their kings. They shall stand dumbfounded, speechless in his presence. For they shall see and understand 
what they had not been told before. They shall see my servant beaten and bloodied. So disfigured, one could scarcely know it was a person standing there. So shall he cleanse many nations. <laughs> Who else outside of Jewish Yeshua has ever fulfilled these scriptures? All the nations have and continue to turn to God the God of Abraham because of Jesus. I love the Jews today and I'm saved because of Jesus. Rulers of nations as well as their subjects stand in awe at his suffering so that mankind might be saved. This is because as we saw previously all the nations are included in God's promise to Abraham. God said that through him all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. We also saw in Acts 15, 14 that the Gentiles all over the world would be called to bear and honor God's name. God had prophesied through Malachi 450 years earlier that this would come to pass. <laughs> Let's slip back to the Amplified tra Translation and see this prophecy in Malachi 1 and 11. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name shall be great among the nations. And in every place incense shall be offered in my name. And indeed a pure offering for my name shall be great among the nations, says the Lord of hosts. Listen, my Jewish friends, this is coming to pass. God's name is being honored by the true Christians throughout the world. God is teaching us Christian Gentiles all about his holy name and we are helping him to carry out his purpose and fulfill his word. I pray that as other Christians continue to hear the truth on these tapes, they will do likewise. If they really love God, they will. We true Christians will bring honor to God's name by obeying all his righteous commands and by carrying out his word, especially the instructions that will help vindicate his name. You see, at this time, Israel's plight is like that of the wayward prodigal son who returned home. You remember that Jesus spoke of the prodigal son in a parable? Before today, the Christian world has only used this parable as an example of God's mercy to the backslidden individual Christian. But this parable has an even deeper, greater meaning. Let's take a look at Jesus' parable in Luke 15, 11 through 32. Within this parable that Jesus told, many revelations of future events are hidden. Much of what Jesus foretold here has already come to pass, while the rest will take place in God's perfect timing. Today I'm going to give you only a brief glimpse into the truths contained within this parable because we must stick to our subject. You remember that Abraham had two sons. Abraham's eldest son, Ishmael, was the forefather of the Arab nations. Abraham's youngest son was Isaac, who, as you know, was the forefather of the Jewish nation, Israel. In the parable, the eldest son represents the Arab nations, while the youngest son represents the nation of Israel. As we go through the explanation of this parable, think of the father as God, the oldest son as the Arab nations, and the youngest son as Israel. As you remember, both sons of Abraham were promised blessings by God. Let's begin with verses 11 through 12. And he said, 
there was a certain man who had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the part of the property that falls me. And he divided the livelihood between them. The youngest son, Israel, wanted all that God had promised, but without God's watchful eye or the restraint of the father's authority. Israel did not want to live by the father's laws, God's word. Israel wanted to do his own thing. He was disobedient and rebellious. And so Israel left God and the path of righteousness and took all that God had blessed him with and squandered it in loose and wicked living. Verse 13. And not many days after that, the youngest son gathered up all that he had and journeyed into a distant country. And there he wasted his fortune in reckless and loose from restraint living. Let's see a portion of scripture that describes exactly what Israel did with the blessings he received from the Father. I'll pick out the most relevant verses. You can read the whole chapter after the lesson. Here God likens what Israel did to an adulterous wife. Ezekiel 16, beginning with verse 10. I clothed you also with embroidered cloth and shod you with fine sea leather, and I girded you about with fine linen, and I covered you with silk. I decked you also with ornaments, and I put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck, and I put a ring in your nostril and earrings in your ears and a beautiful crown upon your head. Thus you were decked with gold and silver, and your raiment was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil, and you were exceedingly beautiful, and you prospered into royal estate. And your renown went forth among the nations for your beauty, for it was perfect through my majesty and splendor which I had put upon you, says the Lord. But you trusted and relied on your own beauty and were unfaithful to God and played the harlot in idolatry because of your renown and poured out your fornications upon every one who passed by worshipping the idols of every nation which prevailed over you. His it was. And you took some of your garments and made for yourself gaily decorated high places or shrines and played the harlot on them, things which should not have come and that which should not take place. You did also take your fair jewels and beautiful vessels of my gold and my silver which I had given you and made for yourselves images of men and you played the harlot with them. And you took your embroidered garments and covered them and set my oil and my incense before them. My bread also, which I gave you, fine flour and oil and honey with which I fed you. You have even set it before the idols for a sweet odor. Thus it was, says the Lord. Slip down to verse 27 where God says, Behold, therefore, I have stretched out my hand against you, diminished your ordinary allowance of food, and delivered you over to the will of those who hate and despise you, the daughters of the Philistines, who turned away in shame from your despicable policy and lewd behavior, for they are faithful to their gods. Israel squandered all his blessings, breaking every command of God and even the very heart of God. Let's read Luke 15 through 13 again. Verse 13. And not many days after that, the younger son gathered up all that he had and journeyed into a distant country, and there he wasted his fortune in reckless and loose from restraint living. God cast them off the land as he said he would do if they broke his commandments. God dispersed them among the nations. Israel lost everything. He sank as low as he could go 
And while he was in this pathetic condition, no one reached out with a helping hand. No one befriended him. Luke fifteen fourteen through 16. And when he had spent all he had, a mighty famine came upon that country, and he began to fall behind and be in want. So he went and forced, glued himself upon one of the citizens of that country who sent him into a field to feed hogs. And he would gladly have fed on and filled his belly with the carob pods that the hogs were eating. But they could not satisfy his hunger and nobody gave him anything better. To catch a glimpse of the younger sons, the Jews' misery and want, all one has to do is remember what they went through during the Second World War, when the animals of the world were treated better than they were. Truly, this parable tells their sad story. They suffered things no one should have to go through. And as they sat among the pigs, pigs which represented everything that was classed as unclean to them, they finally came to their senses. Sin sick and in desperate need, they longed for a place of safety and warmth. Verse 17. Then when he came to himself, he said, How many hired servants of my father have enough food and to spare? But I am perishing, dying here of hunger. I will get up and go to my father. I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Just make me one of your hired servants. The Jews desired to go back home. They didn't ask for anything but their bare necessities of life. They were weary. They had been through so much. Anything was better than what they had. They decided to humble themselves and go back home. They hoped their father, God, would be receive them and allow them to come back home. And wouldn't you know it? God ran to meet his people with open arms. God was ready to keep his promise to faithful Abraham and the timing was now right. For God had told them through Moses that when they would turn to the Lord and be obedient to his voice, he would bring them back to the land of Israel in the last days, Deuteronomy chapter 4. God didn't say when they recognized and accepted Messiah, he would bring them home. He said when they turned to him and obeyed his voice. This must have already taken place since God has allowed them to return home. God's plan in bringing them home is so they will be on the promised land to carry out his end of time purposes. For as we saw in the scriptures, they will be back in Israel for Christ's second coming. Then they will recognize him and mourn over their past rejection of him. How exciting it is to see God keeping his promise to Abraham. This is why God welcomed the Jews back home. And as you know, in 1948, they became a nation in a day, as God had prophesied thousands of years before. Let's see now how God joyfully welcomed the Jews home in verses 20 through 24. So he got up and came to his own father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was moved with pity and tenderness for him. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him fervently. And the son said to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. I no longer deserve to be recognized as a son of yours. But the father said to his bond servants, Bring quickly the best robe, the festive honor robe, and put it on him. And give him a ring for his hand, and sandals for his feet, and bring out that wheat fattened calf, and kill it. And let us revel and feast, and be happy and merry, because this my son was dead, and is alive again. He was lost, and is found. 
and they began to revel and feast and make merry. I'm unhappy to say the older brother, the Arabs, was not pleased about Israel's return. Let's see this in verses 25 through 32. Verse 25. But his oldest son was in the field, and as he returned and came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And having called one of the servant boys to him, he began to ask what this meant. And he said to him, your, fa your brother has come, and your father has killed the wheat fattened calf, because he has received him safe and well. But the elder brother was angry with deep-seated wrath, and resolved not to go in. Then his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Lo, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me so much as a little kid that I might revel and feast and be happy and make merry with my friends. You might say, But the Arab nations are Muslims, so how can they say they're keeping God's commands? This is true, they are Muslims. Yet they profess to worship the same God the Jews worship, the one true God, the God of Abraham. And even though they have been greatly misled in many areas, they think they are keeping God's commands. Verse 29 is exactly the kind of statement a Muslim would make. We have never disobeyed your command. The Illustrated World Encyclopedia tells us that as well as the Quran, quote, Islam also recognizes some parts of the Hebrew Torah as sacred, as well as the Psalms of the Old Testament and the teachings of Jesus, unquote. So I do hope the Islamic leaders will pay attention to these teachings from the Old Testament, the Psalms, the Torah, and the teachings of Jesus, since all these teach us to be pro-Jew and pro-Israel for God's name's sake. Let's read from verse 28 again. But the elder brother was angry with deep-seated wrath and resolved not to go in. Then his father came out and began to plead with him. But he answered his father, Lo, these many years I have served you, and I have never disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me so much as a little kid that I might revel and feast and be happy and make merry with my friends. But when this son of yours arrived, who has devoured your living with immoral women, you have killed for him that wheat fan calf. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. But it was fitting to make merry, to revel and feast and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Let's read verse 28 again. But the elder brother was angry with deep-seated wrath and resolved not to go in. Then the father came out and began to plead with him. This is exactly what happened when the Jews returned home. The older brother, the Arabs, was furious at the arrival of the Jews. Let me give you a brief rundown of the circumstances that surrounded the Jews' return to the land of promise. You can find this information in most history books or encyclopedias. I took most of my facts from the Illustrated World Encyclopedia. A group of Jewish leaders called the Zionists purposed in their hearts to make a national home for the Jewish people in Palestine. The leader of the Zionists was named Shame Wiesman. He later became the first president of Israel. Great Britain had control of Palestine in 1917 and was in favor of making a Jewish national home in Palestine. God was already working to bring about his promise to Abraham and clear his own name. 
Great Britain issued a declaration called the Balfour Declaration. This declaration, which was named for Great Britain's Foreign Secretary, who was the man who issued it, stated that Great Britain would support the building of a Jewish homeland. The Arabs, however, were strictly opposed to Jewish immigration since they themselves had already settled on the land that God had given to the Jews. The Arabs wanted the promised land for themselves. So they fought against Israel and in doing so, they fought against God. Israel was forced to retaliate or be annihilated. Sporadic fighting continued. It became a way of life. Then came World War II, during which many Jews flocked to Israel in order to escape persecution by the Germans and to survive. When the end of the war came, many Jewish people tried to return home to Israel, to the land that Great Britain had promised to them, to the land that Great Britain had promised to support them on while they built it into a fit place to live. But I'm ashamed to say that instead of being met with the support that had been promised, the Jews were met with British warships and British soldiers who actually fought with them, refusing to allow them to disembark from the boats which had brought them home. The British government in power at that time did not keep their word. They did not keep the Balfour Agreement. They were trying to appease the Arabs at the cost of their declaration. Finally, Great Britain turned the problem over to the United Nations, and they were responsible for dividing Palestine into two parts. One part for Arabs, and one part for Jews. Like the younger brother in the parable, the younger son Israel was willing to settle for what the father would give him. But not so with the Arabs, the older son. They swore to go to war rather than let the Jews share Israel's own land, the land that God himself had given to the Jews only. The Arabs wanted all the land of Israel for themselves. Despite the Arabs' continual harassment, in 1948, the Jews declared themselves the Independent Republic of Israel under the United Nations Partisan Plan. That's how they fulfilled God's prophecy, which was spoken thousands of years before by Isaiah the prophet. Isaiah 66 and 8. Verse 8. They became a nation in a day. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such a thing? Shall a land be born in one day? Or shall a nation be brought forth in a moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. Praise the Lord our God, for he is faithful to keep all his word and his promises. But the Arabs didn't know what a great miracle of God had taken place before their eyes. They were furious with deep-seated wrath. They attacked Israel, thinking they could snuff her out while she was still young and vulnerable. But God was there to protect his people for his name's sake. In 1949, the United Nations arranged for an armistice, but no peace settlement was obtained. Even to this very day, the Arabs continue to say they are at war with Israel. They hate Israel. In the ignorance of what God is doing, they have harassed Israel from day one. We'll move on in history to another very important event. In 1967, Nasser of the United Arab Republic tried to block the Gulf of Aqaba. Israel's only water outlet to the Red Sea. Nasser convinced other Arab nations to surround Israel with tanks and all kinds of war machinery. Border breakouts had been going on for about 10 years, but this action brought about full-scale war. Again, 
the Lord God was with Israel. This tiny country, with its population of less than three million people, won that war. They completely whipped the Arab nations whose combined population was approximately 110 million. By the time this war was over, which only lasted six days, 15,000 Arabs had been killed and 50,000 were wounded. Another 11,500 were captured. But the amazing thing is only 679 Israelis were killed. 2,563 were wounded and only 16 were captured. Miraculous, isn't it? It was also during this six-day war, which you must keep in mind was started by the Arabs, that the Jews took possession of the old city of Jerusalem. What a day! After 19 years, the Jews could again pray at the sacred wailing wall. Old Jerusalem is back in the hands of its rightful owners, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Praise God! The Arabs are still allowed to visit their mosque, but the land it sits on belongs to the Jews. But let's not forget the reason God gave the Jews victory over the Arab nations. He did it in order to keep his promise to Abraham and to protect his own holy name. He did not do it because of the Jews or because he does not love the Arabs. God loves all people. God is not partial in his judgment. Oh, if only the Arab people could understand what God is doing. If only they would lay aside their own desires and think only of God's reputation. If only every Arab who wants to see God's will done on the earth would reach out to Israel and support her for God's namesake. It can be done because they are Christian Arabs who pray for Israel. They are some righteous Christian Arabs who love God. Yet as a whole, the angry elder brother, the Arab nations, certainly lived up to Jesus' prophecy in this parable, didn't they? But this doesn't have to continue. Let each individual Arab purpose in their heart to let go of their anger and resentment toward Israel. For God tells us all why he wants us to rejoice with him over Israel's return. To see this reason for rejoicing, let's look again at Jesus' parable, Luke 15, 31 through 32. Verse 31. And the father said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. The Arab nations had not been anywhere. They had been there all the time. Of course the father would make a fuss over the return of his long-lost son. And let's see why he did. The father said in verse 32, But it was fitting to make merry, to revel and feast and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. God's son Israel was dead, but is now alive again. This is what God wants you to be joyful about. After all, it is through Israel that God will keep his promise to Abraham and also vindicate his own name. God needs Israel alive and well. Ezekiel prophesied 2,600 years ago that the dead nation of Israel would live again. Let's see Ezekiel's prophecy in the vision of the dry bones. I hope you'll read this whole chapter after the lesson's over. Ezekiel 37, 11 through 14. These verses speak of the younger son, dead Israel, who comes alive again. Verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is lost. We are completely cut off. I know in the past the Jews must have felt like dead men, totally cut off without hope, as it is written. Verse 12. 
Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I will bring you back home to the land of Israel. And you shall know that I am the Lord, your sovereign ruler. When I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves, O my people, and I shall put my spirit in you and you shall live and I shall place you in your own land. Then you shall know, understand, and realize that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. God said Israel would be so bad off that they would say, we are dead. However, God also said he would open their graves and they would live again on the land of Israel. Listen, folks. Hitler built a museum. In this building, he collected articles and objects of all kinds that had once belonged to the Jewish people. His plan was to dedicate this monstrosity of a museum to an extinct race, the Jews. Had it not been for the intervention of God Almighty, he would have succeeded. The devil tried to use Hitler and the Nazis to prevent God from keeping his promise to Abraham. He tried to prevent God from clearing his name by destroying the only people through whom he can vindicate that name. The Nazis and now the Arabs were and are tools of the enemy and they don't even realize it. The Arabs think they're doing God a favor by trying to destroy Israel, while all the time they are instead harassing and desiring the annihilation of the race of people God has brought up from the grave and made alive again for the purpose of clearing his own name. You don't think the Jews have been mistreated all these years just because they're Jews, do you? No. The devil has used ignorant people to try to undermine God's plans. The devil is responsible for stirring up all the hate and anger men have vent upon the Jewish people. He has tried to use the ignorant and wicked people of the world to wipe out the Jewish race in order to ruin God's reputation, his name. But he has lost the battle. Israel, God's youngest son, has come up out of his grave and is back home on the land of Israel. Jesus' prophecy has been fulfilled to the letter. Luke 15, verse 32. Verse 32. But it was fitting to make merry, to revel and feast and rejoice, for this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. Can you now see what a difficult situation this is? Israel, the lost dead son, returned home only to be met by his angry elder brother who resented the father's merciful and forgiving attitude towards his younger brother. The Arabs had envisioned having all the land for themselves, but God could not and would not permit them to take Israel's land. For his name's sake, he cannot allow them to have it because he has already promised it to the descendants of Isaac and Jacob. By God keeping this promise and showing mercy to the Jews, he is actually showing mercy to his own name. But the Arabs, in their lack of understanding, don't have enough insight to be able to see the real issue. We Gentile Christians also need to be very careful we don't want to be guilty of this same offense. We don't want to fall into the same category with the Arabs, the older brother, and become angry or envious when we see God making a fuss over Israel. Instead, we need to do as God said and rejoice with him over Israel's return. In this lesson, God in his mercy has even shown you what to rejoice about. Rejoice that Israel is alive again in order to clear God's name. 
God is not showing partiality to Israel. He simply wants his name cleared, and he deserves to have it cleared. God's name must come first, and you, Christian, must want it to come first. Many Christians, in the ignorance of God's word, expected the newly founded nation of Israel to immediately recognize Jesus Christ as their Messiah. When this didn't happen, they were deeply disappointed. This was because they didn't understand the real issue in this matter either. They didn't understand that God's first priority is to vindicate his own name. Everything else is secondary. Throughout the scriptures, God has described how he will go about vindicating his name. But like the Jews, most Christians do not know the scriptures. If they did, they would be aware that certain circumstances involving Israel must take place exactly as they are unfolding so that God's word can be fulfilled to the letter.